Okay, familia, so y'all know how we give it up normally on this channel. I go over the victims' lives and humanize them before getting into the sad details of their ending stories. However, I will be tackling the story similar to how I did the Courtney Palmer story, and this will be lengthy, so I'm going to just ask y'all to just please stick it out with me through the entire video. After I covered Courtney's story, this one was highly requested in my comments, so if you've never heard about this before, just know you're in for an awful ride. And if you have heard this story before, that's fine, but you never heard Bonita tell it, so stick around. FYI, a lot of my information and images were gathered from the first 48 episode about this story, so much credit to them. I also gathered a lot of information from news sources, YouTube interviews, and articles that the first 48 didn't detail. And you can always find the link to the sources in my description. Now that we've got the disclaimers out of the way, let's get into the Leicester Street Massacre. It was a cold, rainy Sunday night on March 2nd, 2008, when 911 received a call from a woman stating that she stopped by her son's house at 722 Leicester Street in Memphis, Tennessee, and the door was wide open with no response from anyone in the home. And I'm assuming that she didn't want to just walk in, which was smart, hence her calling police for pretty much would have been a wellness check. So the dispatcher tells her, okay, no worries, I'm gonna have a car head out there to see what's going on. Police pull up, then they entered the home. And when they went inside, they discovered a horrifying scene that even the most experienced law officials weren't ready to approach. Upon entry, there laid five different bodies in the living room, four adults and a two-month-old baby girl. All the adults were deceased with a couple small bodies in one of the back bedrooms, also deceased, totaling six people gone. And also in that home were three other young children who were badly injured in critical condition and were immediately rushed to the emergency room in an attempt to save their lives. Several people have been standing around outside to see what was going on as more authorities poured into the gruesome scene. As lead detectives arrived, uniformed officers began to brief the investigators about all they knew thus far. Authorities had to put on their forensic suits and latex gloves to enter the home for their investigation and evidence discovery and told police that were outside to not allow anyone into the home regardless of their rank. As detectives entered the home, they immediately walked right into the literal bloodshed with the four adult victims' bodies riddled with bullet wounds. The living room was ransacked. Everything was thrown everywhere. The carpet and the couch were soaked in blood. You saw bullet holes in the furniture. It was truly a horrific sight. The victims were identified as 30-year-old Cecil Dotson, who was renting the home. 27-year-old Marissa Williams, who was Cecil's girlfriend and the mother of his four children, 33-year-old Hollis Seals, and his girlfriend, 25-year-old Shindari Robinson, who were both friends of Cecil. As detectives looked further into the home, they began stating their theory that the homicides may have started off in the bathroom as they saw massive amounts of blood smeared all on the toilet and in the bathtub, and then eventually made their way into the back of the home where they discovered another chaotic scene in the children's bedroom with blood spatter all over the walls, blood on the blinds of the windows, and more in the small beds. In the bedroom is where they discovered the deceased bodies of two of Cecil's young sons, a four-year-old and a two-year-old. And you could see their little sneakers just, you know, thrown about in the room and bed sheets all disheveled, everything just thrown around looking a mess. It was just an awful, awful thing to see. I honestly don't even know how detectives do the work that they do because, especially homicide detectives, because the photos of the scene alone was just breaking me down. Now, the investigators on the scene began to process the home and collect evidence, and they saw a small, clear Ziploc baggie filled with 16 shell casings apparently from two different firearms, a 9mm and a 380. So they believe that the suspect had gathered all their casings in an attempt to take it with them, but apparently forgot it there. 
As investigators looked around the victim's bodies, they ended up discovering a shotgun between the couch and a wall that hadn't even been touched. And this made them believe that Cecil, the head of the household, may have been reaching for it to defend himself, but just didn't get the chance to. And they also discovered a bloody knife blade, which was a butcher knife. And they had actually found a few knife blades in the handles that they were detached from scattered around the home. They also found broken off pieces of wood with blood all over them. And they believe that they had been used to beat the children with. Police said, based on the condition of the victim's bodies, they had to have been there for well over 24 hours. After examining the home, medics began to remove all the adults' bodies and body bags on stretchers, while carrying out the children's bodies in body bags in their arms. I never saw body bags that small in my life. Investigators even expressed how gruesome the scene was, especially the way they found those poor innocent children in there dead and the other ones clinging on to life. As investigators huddled up to speak to each other about what they believe happened, they said Cecil, whose body was in a kneeling position in front of his couch, may have been the main target while everyone else was probably collateral, you know, like a leave no witness behind kind of thing. And they felt like whoever the suspect was, they had to have been allowed to come into the home because there was no sign of struggle in the entrance. So, of course, now the story gets put out to the public. Police are asking for help. They're asking for any information that could lead to finding a suspect and ultimately an arrest. As detectives huddled up back at the station, they got word on the condition of the three children that were taken to the hospital. And it was reported that the infant baby had head wounds and the other two boys had head trauma with one of them who still had a knife blade broken off and stuck in his head. While they had multiple facial fractures, fractures to the skull and stab wounds on both eyes. And as they were discussing the condition of the children, is when they came to the realization of how long those children had been laying in that home, clinging on to their life with these injuries. Because remember, the deceased bodies were said to have been there for well over 24 hours. So that's obviously the same amount of time that those children were laying there as well. Now, remember I said earlier, the shell casings came from a 9mm and a 380, two different firearms. So as investigators are discovering what they believe to have happened, they mentioned they felt it had to have been at least two to three people who were responsible for shooting the adults and causing the blunt force trauma and the stabbing of the children. So, you know, the Memphis Homicide Unit was like, all, right, all hands on deck, no matter the position, because they got to get to the bottom of this. You know, whoever could grab whatever information was expected to do so. And physical evidence was taken into the Tennessee Bureau of Investigation to be processed, hoping to pick up on a DNA hit, fingerprints, anything to help bring clarity to this mortifying case. So now people are starting to talk and one of the first ones to come and speak on what they knew was a young teenage girl who had been related to Cecil Dodson and she actually lived at 722 Leicester Street with the family. But thankfully, when all that went down happened, she was staying at her mother's house at the time. So when the young lady was talking to them, she mentioned that Cecil and his brother, a man named Jesse, also known as Junior, had been previously talking about someone they robbed. Apparently, they had caught a lick a few weeks prior, and she heard Cecil talking about how they had robbed a man named Doc some firearms so now they hear these names and they get to looking into who jesse is or whatever his background may be and they will start turning like okay this robbery just may have been the motive behind the homicides the detectives call cecil's brother jesse in for questioning jesse pulls up to the memphis homicide department and sergeants terry max and joe stark interview him they ask him when's the last time he saw his brother cecil Jesse tells them he last saw him on a Saturday. They ask him, who do you think could have done this to your brother and your family? And Jesse tells them that Caesar was having problems with this man named Doc Holiday. And remember, that's the dude that the teen girl mentioned earlier. So Jesse said that Cecil and Doc were both part of the same game. So the investigators ask him, like, okay, did you and your brother do anything to antagonize Doc? And Jesse's sitting there like, mm-mm, nope, which is clearly a lie based on what the teenage girl has already told them. 
But Jesse is doubling down. He's like, nope, I ain't never had no issues with Doc. He'll tell you himself. Him and I never even really crossed paths with each other like that. So they asked Jesse if he would happen to know Doc's real name. He said he didn't. So they asked him, like, okay, so what's the beef between Cecil and Doc? And Jesse said both Cecil and Doc were called to a meeting by their gang against the Disciples or simply known as the GDs. And Jesse claims that Cecil was like, well, I ain't going to that meeting. And so they asked Jesse, okay, well, what's supposed to take place at this meeting? And Jesse like, well, they were supposed to go on trial or something, you know, like within the gang, they have these meetings or trials or whatever is going on with the gang. And the detectives is like, okay, and what happens if they get found guilty at these meetings or at these trials? And Jesse's like, I don't know, I guess they get their punishment or something. But as he's saying this, he has this like eerie, devilish, wide you know, on his face. And his body language through the whole thing was just, he was just so calm and just, like, he ain't give a fuck, to be honest. And the detectives was kind of looking at him too, like, what you smiling for? But they didn't even really pick up on that for real. So they asked Jesse, like, okay, well, what does this punishment entail of? And he's like, I don't know. I'm not part of that. Like, I'm not in that lifestyle. So they didn't get much from Jesse. And they allowed him to leave. And the detectives step out of the room. They huddle up. And they're like, you know, listen, we heard of GD homicides, but they ain't never gave it up like this to execute a whole entire family, including the kids. It didn't sound like no gang homicide kind of thing. It was overkill. Nonetheless, they still get to digging into this guy, Doc Holliday's background because, you know, they got to cross all their T's and dot all their I's. So while they doing that, one of the sergeants went back to the hospital to check on the children that were fighting for their lives, hoping that maybe one of them could talk to them and tell them what happened. And thankfully, at this point is when it's realized that all the children that were in the hospital would absolutely survive. Thank God. One of the children who happened to be the oldest, known as CJ, who was just nine years old at the time, was in good enough health to be able to talk to the detectives. One of the sergeants described CJ to have had his eyes swollen shut, but he was still able to talk. And they asked him if he could remember what happened to him and his family. And he said, yes, he does remember. He said he remembered there being a knock on the door and his mother opened the door to whoever was there. And when they came in, everybody was in a circle and started fighting. But as little CJ is telling the story to the detectives, he started to cry. And under all the stress of remembering all that was happening, he began hyperventilating. The poor baby was reliving the entire moment all over again as he provided the details of that gruesome night. That in combination with all the meds he was on, he really was in no condition to continue that conversation. So investigators decided they'd wait for CJ to recover further before asking him anything else. Now, in the midst of all this, the homicide team gets a phone call from a person of much interest after being mentioned a couple times, and it was Mr. Doc Holliday himself. He called in and he said, you know, I heard y'all want to talk to me. And they like, yeah, we do. So he like, all right, bet. He pulls up to meet with the detectives. They ask him straight up, what gang are you a part of? He like, I ain't affiliated with no gang. They like, well, that's what everybody else is saying. And he like, okay, they could say whatever they want to say. It don't mean that it's true. So they ask him if he thinks Cecil was capable of setting him up to get robbed. And Doc was like, absolutely not. Never in life. Now, remember to stay with me. Keep in mind that this whole part of the story is important because this is supposedly the motive for how all those innocent lives were taken, right? So the investigators are pretty much like, Doc, cut the shit. We already know the vibes. We know what's going on. And Doc is letting them know he never had any kind of beef or static with Cecil. And he pretty much didn't know anything about why Cecil and his family ended up slaughtered. So at that point, detectives really had no choice but to let Doc leave since he couldn't give them any of the information that they needed. So tensions are high. Time is ticking. And authorities are desperate for information. So Memphis Homicide puts out a 30000 U.S. dollar award for anybody who can give them anything valuable that'll lead to an arrest. And you know money talks. So now the phone lines get flooded with folks calling in about whatever they may say they know. 
So the wheels were turning as detectives began to dig deeper, feeling like there had to be more of a personal reason as to why this entire household of people was taken out the way that they were. They decide to look into the GD's members and ex-gang members, and they reached out to a former GD to ask him, how does the whole meeting thing go for a gang member if they get found guilty or something like that? And the former GD member said, normally it ends up in a DV, which means death violation, taking someone's life. And this made the detectives perk up because remember, Cecil's brother, Jesse, told them something about Cecil avoiding a meeting. So it's like, hmm, maybe that's why he avoided that meeting. Maybe he knew what would happen to him if he went there. And maybe they came and got him since he didn't show up. And the former GD said the details of the story he heard so far made him believe the GDs ordered a blackout team to the home, with blackout meaning everybody had to go. So they asked the former GD member if the guy Doc could order something like that against Cecil, and he said no. He said it would have had to come from Doc's big homie, and unfortunately, he didn't know who Doc's big homie was, so he couldn't provide any information on his name or even his street name, for that matter. But now with this information about a blackout, detectives feel like the entire Dotson family is in danger, and the GDs might be looking to take out more members of the family. So they placed the entire family into protective custody, including Jesse. In the midst of that, Cecil's sister Nicole tells detectives that she had already moved her family out of her apartment to another family's house because she was afraid for their lives. And the same night that she left, she began receiving threatening phone calls. But these phone calls was coming from the apartment she just moved out of. So someone had went into her apartment, more than likely looking for her, used the landline to call her cell phone and threaten her life. And she said she had no clue who it could have been. So at this time, she's like, you know, terrified that somebody is literally squatting in her home waiting for her to come back. So she gives the investigators the key to the back door of her apartment and they head over to her crib to see if they could catch whoever is there or see if they could even come up on another crime scene. Police get there, but no one was in the home and there wasn't even any signs of forced entry into the home. But Nicole and them remained in protective custody anyway. A couple days had gone by since investigators last spoke to little CJ, who was still in the hospital, and they went back to talk to him again. But this time, they decided to record the conversation. And this is when shit gets crazy, because CJ told the detectives that the person who stabbed him and slaughtered his entire family was Uncle Junior. And remember who I said Junior was earlier? Cecil's very own brother, Jesse, Jesse, a.k.a. Junior, the one that the detectives spoke to before they could speak to really anybody else and sold them that story about the damn GDs. And not only did CJ identify Jesse as the one who did it, he revealed that Jesse caused all that pain all by himself. Remember, the investigators felt like this had to have been done by more than one person. Well, no, CJ confirmed it was all Jesse. The Memphis homicide team gagged. They couldn't believe it. This dude was literally sitting in protective custody with his family. Nobody else, none the wiser. Whole time, he the family worst damn nightmare. So now investigators received a tip that there had been some tension brewing between Cecil and Jesse because it was alleged that Jesse released Cecil snitched on him for something else that I'll get into later. But now the motive behind the slings has shifted, leaving detectives to have to approach this whole thing from an entirely new angle. Memphis Homicide asked Jesse, who was 33 years old at the time, to come in and talk to them again for another interview. This man comes back, sits down with them again as if he has no worry in the world that maybe, just maybe, he's been figured out already, right? So they ask him, what was he up to on the day that this awful event happened to his family? He says, not much, you know, he just went to work. His brother Cecil picked him up, took him to the crib. Cecil's lady was cooking. They was all just kicking and shooting the shit. And then Cecil dropped him off, you know, just another smooth day. And so the detectives are like, okay, hmm. They throw another angle at him and they ask him, what means the most to you in this whole wide world? Don't you know this man says, my family? He says his family means 
everything to him. So one of the other detectives walk into the room and he starts to do his little tactics to make this man feel comfortable. You know, oh, I'm here for you. Just tell me what's on your mind holding his hand and all that type of mush mouth stuff. And then the detective asks Jesse, what's the nickname that your family calls you? Jesse, dumbass, says, Junior. And the detective is like, oh yeah? Boom, pulls out the damn tape recording of little CJ saying, Uncle Junior is the one who stabbed him. Now at this point, the detective is applying crazy pressure. He's like, that's you, you're Junior, you did this. And it's real tense between him and Jesse in this moment. The detective is like, I, right, you may as well say what happened that day. So now Jesse gets to talking. And he said that he and Cecil had been outside riding around and they were arguing all day. They were arguing about whatever, nonstop, all the way until they got home. And even when they got home, they were still arguing. And he said once they got inside the home, that out of nowhere, Cecil reached his 12 gauge shotgun which then in turn made Jesse pull his firearm out and he just started shooting. So the detective asks him how many times did he shoot his brother? And Jesse says he don't know. They asked him about the women that were in the home. At first he said he didn't do anything to the women. Then the detective asked him, didn't you shoot them? And then that's when he just admits to it like, yeah, I did. Then he says the kids saw what he did, so he tried to get rid of the kids by stabbing them using the knives from the kitchen drawer. At this point, the detective tells him to be right back, and Jesse asks if he could speak to his mom. An hour after requesting to speak to his mom, she shows up to the interview room, and Jesse is sitting there with her, and he's telling her his side, saying that, oh, when Cecil picked up the shotgun, he eventually set it back down, but... At that point, Jesse already started to go crazy and he just started shooting. So she asks him like, okay, what happened to the babies? And he tells her they got stabbed. And she's like, you stabbed them? And he's like, yeah. And so she asks why? He says, because they saw everything. And he's telling this to his mother, who is also Cecil's mother and the grandmother to the little boys who died and the other kids who were injured, mind you. And he's telling her this She's sitting there literally looking stuck and shocked. But eventually after Jesse confessed everything to his mother, they get up from the table and she hugs him. She hugs her son. They embrace each other and she tells him that she loves him. Now, at the end of the first 48 episode, there's a caption stating that Jesse was convicted and charged with six counts of first degree homicide and three counts of first degree attempted homicide. According to timesnews.com in October of 2010, it took a jury less than two hours to deliberate at his trial after viewing graphic photos of the victims showing their gruesome injuries. And Jesse was sentenced to six death penalty sentences for the six deceased victims. According to localmemphis.com, he was also given three consecutive 40-year sentences for the three children's lives that he attempted to take. During the sentencing, as the prosecutor spoke about Jesse's satanic actions while arguing for the death penalty in his closing argument, Jesse started clapping his hands, being a dickhead until someone on his defense team stopped him. And speaking of his defense team, they tried to give this sob story about Jesse being neglected by his mom and having a learning disability and his upbringing being surrounded by street thugs influencing his mind and they were bringing in this angle to try and get him life in prison no parole without facing the death penalty during his trial jesse tried to say he wasn't even the one who committed these crimes he said he hid under the bed our gang bangers were the ones in the house knocking everyone off and never bothered telling police this story because he was supposedly in fear for his life even though he had already confessed everything so at this point, CJ was just 11 years old when he testified against Jesse during trial, telling him everything about what he remembered happening, as well as Jesse's mom and CJ's little brother testifying, who was only eight years old at the time. Now, fast forward, as a young adult, CJ actually ended up speaking out several times about what happened to him and his family. One of his sit-downs being in April of 2022, when he was 23 years old with a channel here on YouTube called Wicked Films, 
you could go watch that interview in its entirety by clicking their link in my description box. But to give you a briefing, he recalled all that remembered from that night. Being a nine-year-old little boy who was in the room with his brother when he just heard shots go off. He said he came out the room to see what was going on and saw a man on the floor with a bullet hole in his head and saw his father Cecil with a firearm aimed at him begging for his life. He said he walked back to the room where his brother was and he went back out the room to see what was going on because it had gotten too quiet. And then he said he saw one of the girls get shot dead and just seeing everyone get taken out one by one. But then he says how Based on the things he's heard, he believes that Jesse then wanted to do this because it was said that he was planning this for a while, talking to people about his plans of taking his whole family out. And I'll get into who he was talking to in a moment. But CJ went on to explain that Jesse initially sliced him in his neck with a knife. And then as CJ was attempting to call 911, he dropped the phone because Jesse had struck him in the head. And he said he told Jesse he was just trying to go to the bathroom, but Jesse hit him in the head again with a butcher knife. And when Jesse hit him, he fell back into the tub and started to hold his own neck, trying to keep the blood from spilling out. He said he could still see everything that Jesse was doing from the bathroom. And his brother walked into the bathroom and he could see that his brother had blood all over him as well. He said his brother was bleeding from his head and in the midst of all that, his brother was saying that he wanted to lay down. And as his brother went to go lay down, Jesse came and stabbed him again while his brother laid face down. CJ said the entire ordeal was so surreal to him, he couldn't even cry or feel emotion because to him at that time, it was all just a bad dream. At some point, CJ passed out and when he woke up, he saw Jesse was still there in the house. He was in the kitchen grabbing garbage bags. And he said Jesse placed the garbage bag over his hand and began stabbing one of his little brothers. Then Jesse went over to another one of his brothers and shot him and cut him in the face and cut him on the back of his head. At this point, he says his mother and his sister walked into the house and he was praying that Jesse wouldn't do anything to them. He, and he even thought to himself, it was no way Jesse would do anything to hurt them because even Jesse was telling her he didn't want to hurt her. And while he's saying this, she's telling him she doesn't want to die and pretty much begging for her life. Unfortunately, though, it didn't matter because Jesse shot her in the back of her head and then turned his attention to the little baby girl, CJ's sister, because she started crying. So he cut the little baby on her head, on her ankle, and her thigh. And... Thankfully, she too was one of the survivors. He said he had kept going in and out of consciousness, fighting for his life. And one of the times he woke up, he realized that's when all the police and everybody was all up and through the house. So he mustered up the strength to get out of the bathtub, to make himself visible. And a firefighter saw him there and picked him up. And CJ said he could tell that the firefighter thought he was already gone. So he moved his body around so the firefighter would know that he was alive and it worked. Now, as if this story isn't already extremely dark, it gets even darker as CJ reveals that he recalls being in the courtroom and it being revealed that Jesse's DNA was found inside of one of the women that he executed after execution. So yes, if you're thinking what you're thinking, yes, after Jesse shot one of the women, the woman being Shindari, which is the girlfriend of Hollis, and they were both Cecil's friends, he explicitly took advantage of her lifeless body. CJ said, when people ask him, you know, how does he feel about the horrific events that took place? He said it does eat him up that he's lost so many people like that. And mind you, he's the oldest child of his siblings. But he said while he does miss his parents and his siblings, he tries not to think about it too much because it's something that happened and it's nothing that he could do about it. He spoke about being a daddy. And at the time of the interview, his son was three years old. So by now he's five years old. So congratulations to CJ for being a daddy. He said his son is his motivation and what keeps him going. His son keeps him looking forward to working and hustling. 
and he just spoke to how he wants to be as present as he can be for his son. So he lives his life looking for it instead of dwelling on the past. He said he stays away from anything or anyone producing negative energy. But what's unfortunate and ironic is CJ speaks to avoiding negativity and looking for it. But in this very same interview, he admits to being physically violent with his son's mother due to something she did to portray him and he blacked out and he physically harmed her. And he mentioned he doesn't like to get physical because he blacks out and everything from that night comes rushing into his head and he just loses it, which is so sad for me to hear because honestly, just looking at him speak, you can tell his spirit is extremely heavy. You can almost see the dark cloud hanging over his head while still trying to be so strong. And I'm never going to act like any form of domestic violence is okay. Am I shocked hearing that he's capable of it, though? No, I'm not. I'm not shocked at all, considering all that he's been through. It's just very, very unfortunate. And so that's all I'll speak to in terms of the interview. I don't want to give a play-by-play -play of the whole thing because, like I said, you guys could view the whole interview in its entirety by clicking on Wicked Films channel link in the description box of this video. He speaks more on the lessons he's learned in life and the lessons that stuck with him from his father, whether or not he's able to forgive Jesse and stuff like that. You can tell even through all the trauma He's still a young, wise man, just trying to stay on the right path. So yeah, you guys could watch the whole interview if you care to do so. Now, fast forward, right? 16 years later after the massacre. In January of this year, a now 49-year-old Jesse Dotson, who is a death row inmate at Riverbend Maximum Security Institution in Nashville, put in a 249-page petition for an appeal to have all his charges overturned and get off a death row. He said CJ gave false testimony. The petition said CJ was not competent to testify and was affected by drugs. He also claimed there to be improper police tactics, prosecutorial misconduct, suppressed exculpatory evidence, a false confession due to threats and pressure, and ineffective counsel. Jesse made claims that since the TV show, The First 48, was involved, it caused Memphis police to feel pressured to make a conviction. He also included the claims that he made that the slaughtering of his family was the result of gang retaliation after Cecil had crossed multiple members of the GDs. A now 25-year-old CJ responded to his uncle's appeal request and told Fox 13 News that he believes his uncle deserves to die. He said Jesse was lying and didn't believe he deserved any rights at all. And he's grateful to still be alive. And this isn't the first time that Jesse filed an appeal. In July of last year, 2023, he made an appeal for post-conviction relief on the grounds of ineffective assistance of the council, but he was denied by the Tennessee Supreme. For whatever delusional reason, he fully believed that his charges would be overturned and he would be a man set free. His own mother said if that were to ever happen, he won't be seeing her. She'd be getting up out of Dodge because only a monster could do the things that he done in that house. She said she's terrified of her own son and knew that if he could take the lives of the children, let alone anybody for that matter, he would fully be capable of taking her life as well. And speaking of his mother, around the time this story was still fairly new when the public had learned about it and rightfully spoke to how they felt personally about Jesse's punishment, there was still one person who was able to speak some kind of nice words about him, and that was his mother stating that Jesse is her son and she still loves him. However, Jesse was upset with his mother because he said she didn't testify that she was allegedly aware that Memphis police supposedly coerced Jesse into making a false confession to the crimes he committed. He said he forgives his mother, but he'll never forget. Her response was, quote unquote, that's how I know his mind's messed up. He don't have nothing to forgive me for. She said Jesse never told her about the police initially, but had he told her that, she still would have just got up and walked off on him because basically, like, you know, she wouldn't believe him anyway. You see, as I mentioned earlier, Jesse had confessed to his mother of all the details of his sins, and she said she knew Jesse was telling the truth when he made the confession, and he was not coerced by police. Because when he detailed what he did, from her perspective, she said it was almost like 
he was a baby the way he looked when he did it. Keeping his head down. She said she looked at his eyes as he spoke while holding his hands for a long time with him being unable to look back into her her eyes and she knew he was speaking honestly about his heinous acts she said when he finally did look up at her that's when he said the words plainly i did it she said had he not told her with his own words out of his own mouth there wouldn't have been a single person on this earth who could have made her believe that he did what he did and even though his mother was the only family member he was still communicating with she too eventually stopped communicating with him because even though it was hard for her to even afford his jail calls he still felt comfortable verbally abusing her with cursed words and denying everything he already admitted to so for a while she just stopped taking his calls she said she loves her son with all her heart but it's just nothing that she could have done to help him and she was right you know what else could she have possibly done for his evil ass nothing now as if it couldn't get any more crazier What's even more crazy is this isn't even the first time Jesse claimed someone's life. Remember I told you earlier how Jesse believed that Cecil snitched on him for something else? Well, that something else was when Jesse had to serve 13 years of his life out of an 18-year sentence in prison after taking another man's life over a drug deal going wrong. Jesse full-on believed that Cecil was the one who snitched on him and got him locked up. And get this, while Jesse was serving time, he was still a menace in prison because he had 29 discipline write-ups and he stabbed somebody while he was in there. Jesse entered into the prison system at about 19, 20 years old. He was let out at least five years earlier than his original sentence of 18 years. He actually had just gotten out of prison before he executed his family. Apparently, he had only been home for maybe seven months before he did this. And even the prosecutor in the case was like, this man was only in his 30s at the time and had already taken seven whole human lives. And remember, I told you how CJ said he heard Jesse was planning to take out the family and told people about it. Well, apparently he was making those plans while he was in jail and he was telling his cellmates what he wanted to do when he got out. So Jesse had been sitting and seething in these feelings of rage and vengeance against his own family because you see, Jesse had felt entitled to more support than what he felt that he had gotten, as if he didn't take someone's life and was solely responsible for that. His mother said after Jesse got home from serving all that time, she could tell prison changed him. She recalled a conversation between Jesse and his sister Nicole one Christmas when she said to her brother, like, you know, I just know you happy to be home, huh? And he responded to her, no, I had better times in jail than I am now. And Nicole said she believes that Jesse definitely hated his family due to feeling abandoned by them. So, Familia, oh shit, I wrote a community tag post saying, I don't know what kind of mission y'all sent me on to cover this story, but this was wicked. And I covered several horrific stories. This is definitely one of the most evil ones ever. This man literally held on to this vengeful, Obvious raging anger against his own family over something that he did to land him in prison because he felt they weren't helpful enough towards him while he was in there, which, I mean, they ain't the ones that helped you get in there. So what, what more did you want from them? But bro got out and then waited for the slightest inconvenience between him and his family so he could carry out those homicides. And my thing is this, right? None of it should have happened. But the babies, though... The babies, the children, an infant baby, all of them so innocent in all of this. And he over there talking about he had to do it because they all saw what happened. When half of those kids was probably way too young anyway to even be able to say anything. But regardless, they wouldn't have anything to say had you not done that. 
And then his body language, even early investigation, he was just so calm and so careless. And to be honest, I don't even know how the Memphis homicide team didn't pick up on his body language sooner. He was all smiley when he was sitting there, lying in their faces when he came up with that nonsense gangster disciple story. He was out there acting like he so badly wanted to know what happened to his family and was literally sitting up in protective custody, chilling. If it wasn't for CJ, who's to say Jesse would have ever been figured out? And then, you weird freak, you literally inserted yourself into a lifeless body to get one off. Like a freaking sick weirdo. And honestly, I really am just covering the main points in the story. There's way more information out there on this, but I'm literally still working from a laptop that really isn't my normal one. And I can't make this video any longer than what it already is. This laptop doesn't have the bandwidth for it. So, I mean, you know how we do familia. We could always discuss more and discuss things further down in the comments and have a conversation. At the end of the day, Jesse Dotson is an evil, sick, disrupted human being. And may he live the life and die the death that he deserves. I send all my condolences to the families and loved ones of all the victims involved. To the survivors, I pray so deeply for your healing. I pray that you all live your lives to the fullest extent and get as much help as you possibly can get for your trauma. Because this right here, honestly, is like lifelong worth of pain that you'll probably constantly need support for. May Cecil Dotson, Hollis Seals, Marissa Williams, Shandari Robinson, the two little boys, all rest in heavenly peace. None of you, including the survivors, ever, ever deserved any of this. May the deceased spirits live on with their loved ones forever. None of you will ever be forgotten.